the Patriots defeated the Bills last night by a score of 25-6. to The Patriots go to... Six and two on the year. That's five in a row after starting one and two. Buffalo drops the two and six. Tom Brady, 29 to 45, 324 yards. Derek Anderson, 22 of 39, 290 yards and an interception. NBA. A couple games last night. The Blazers defeat the Pacers 103-93. Impressive win. For the Blazers, as they go to 4-2, and two, Indiana's 4-3. and C.J. McCollum had 17. Dame Willard had 16. Al Freak Aminu had 11. Evan Turner off the bench had 13. Zach Collins off the bench had 17. Nick Stauskas had 10 off the bench. Caleb Swanigan had 11 off the bench. For Indiana, Victor Oladipo, 21-9-7. Thad Young had a 16-4. Bogdan Bogdanovich, 14 points. Darren Collison had a 17-6. The 76ers defeated the Hawks 113-92. Phillies 4-3. Atlanta's 2-4. Ben Simmons was phenomenal. 21 points. 12 boards, 9 dishes. Markel Fultz actually had a good game. 16 points, 4 boards, 7 assists, 7 for 16 shooting. Joel Embiid did not have that great of a game. 10 points, 6 boards, 6 assists. But he had good uh, rebounding and assist numbers, though. Mike Muscala off the bench, 14 points, 5 boards. J.J. Redick off the bench, 14 points, 8 boards. Landry Shamit off the bench at 13 points. For Atlanta, Kent Bazemore, 18 points. Trey Young, 11 points. Dwayne Dedman, 11 points off the bench. Amari Spellman, 11 points off the bench. The Kings defeated the Heat 123 to 113. Impressive win for Sacramento, who's four and three. Miami drops the three and three. Willie Cauley Stein, fantastic game, 26 points, 13 boards. De'Aaron Fox had 20 points, four boards, and eight assists. Buddy Hill, 23 points, eight boards, and five assists. Najali Bajika, 19 points, five boards, five assists. Meanwhile, for Miami. Goran Dragic, 20 points and 5 assists. Hassan Whiteside, 16 points and 24 rebounds. Josh Richardson, a career-high 31 points. Tyler Johnson, 11 points off the bench with 4 boards and 4 assists. The Knicks defeated the Nets 115-96 to snap their 5-game losing streak after their opening night win against the Hawks. They're 2-5 and five and so are the Nets. Tim Hardaway Jr. had a nice all-around game. 25 points, 5 boards, 8 assists. Frankie Nilakina, nice game. 16 points, 5 boards, 4 assists. Mitchell Robinson had 11 points. Damian Dotson had 10 points and 5 boards. Ennis Cantor off the bench had a double-double, 15 points and 15 boards. Mario Hazonia had 11 points off the bench. Alonzo Trier had 12 points and 5 boards off the bench. For Brooklyn, D'Angelo Russell, 13 points. Joe Harris, 11 points. Ronda Hallis Jefferson off the bench, 16 points and 7 boards. Spencer Dinwiddie, 17 points off the bench. Shabazz Napier, 12 points off the bench. The Warriors absolutely steamrolled the Bulls, 149-24. to That's an impressive road win for Golden State. They're 7-1. Chicago's 2-5. Klay Thompson, how about this? 52 points, 14 of 24 from 3, 18 of 29 shooting with 5 boards. Steph Curry had 23 points, 8 boards, 5 assists. Kevin Durant had 14 points and 8 assists. Draymond Green, another weird stat line, 3 points. 6 boards and 11 assists. Jonas Repko, 10 points off the bench. Quinton Cook, 16 off the bench. Meanwhile, for Chicago, Zach Levine had 21. Campaign had 15. Wendell Carter Jr. had an 18-7. Jabari Parker off the bench had a 15-9-6, so that's solid. 7 for 15 shooting as well. The Bucks defeated the Raptors 124-109 in the Battle of Unbeatens without their stars. Milwaukee 7-0, Toronto 6-1. Ersan Ilyasova had 19 points and 10 boards. Eric Bledsoe and Malcolm Brogdon had 17 each. 
Chris Middleton had 14 points and 8 assists. Thon Maker off the bench had 11 boards. Or I'm sorry, 11 points and 7 boards. Tony Snell had 11 off the bench. Dante DiVincenzo had 12 off the bench. Serge Ibaka had 30 points and 9 boards. Pascal Siakam had 22 points and 8 boards. Jonas Valanciunas off the bench had 10 points. The Timberwolves defeat the Lakers 124 to 120. Impressive win for the Timberwolves as they go to 3 and 4. The Lakers drop to 2 and 5. Jimmy Butler might have been the best player on the court. He had 32 points, 6 boards, and 4 assists. Carl Anthony Towns had his best game of the early season 25 points, 16 boards, and 6 assists. Josh Kogi, 17 points. Derrick Rose had 11, 7, and 7 off the bench. Anthony Tolliver had 10 off the bench. LeBron James had 29 points, 10 boards, and 7 assists. Brandon Ingram, 24 points in his return. Kyle Kuzma, 19 points, 6 boards. Javal McGee, 13 points, 5 boards. And Lonzo Ball only had 4 points. Rajon Rondo off the bench, 13 points, 6 boards, 8 assists. Lance Stevenson at 11 off the bench. The Spurs defeated the Mavericks 113-108 in overtime. The Spurs are 4-2 and two, the Mavs are 2-5. and five. DeMar DeRozan, 34 points, 9 boards, 4 assists. Bryn Forbes had 12. Rudy Gay had 15. LaMarcus Aldridge had 20 points, 4 boards, and 4 assists. I'm sorry, 6 boards and 4 assists. Marco Bellinelli, 13 points. Patty Mills, 10 points. Meanwhile, for Dallas, Luka Doncic, 31 points, 8 boards, and 4 assists. That's really impressive. Dennis Smith Jr. had 22. Harrison Barnes had 18 and 7 boards. The Nuggets defeated the Pelicans 116-111. The Pels didn't have Anthony Davis. They dropped the 4-2 as Denver improves the 5-1. Gary Harris led the Nuggets in scoring 23 points. Six boards, six assists. Jamal Murray had 23 as well. Nikola Jokic, 12 points, 9 rebounds, and 10 assists. Paul Millsap had 18. Trey Lyles had 17 off the bench. Malik Beasley had 12 points and 6 boards off the bench. Julius Randle off the bench, 24 points, 8 boards, and 6 assists. Each one more at 18. Drew Holiday had 16. Nikola Meritich had 17. Frank Jackson off the bench had 10. Tonight's games, at 7 o'clock you have the Heat and the Hornets, the Hawks and the Cavs, the Kings and the Magic, 7.30 the Pistons and the Celtics. These two teams met, I believe it was this past weekend in Detroit and the Celtics won the game. 7.30 you have the Raptors hosting the 76ers. That's the best game on the board tonight. You have, at 8 o'clock, the underachieving Rockets hosting the Blazers. You have the Wizards at the Grizzlies. And the Clippers at the Thunder. Hockey. Two games last night. The Flames defeated the Maple Leafs 3-1. Good win for Calgary on the road as they go to 6-5-1. Toronto drops to 8-4. The number one star of the game with a goal and assist, Elias Lindholm. The number two star of the game with a goal and assist, Sean Monaghan. The number three star of the game with 31 saves. On 33 shots, Frederick Anderson. The Canucks defeat the Wild 5 2 impressive win for Vancouver as they go to 7 and 6. Minnesota drops to 6 3 and 2. The number one star of the game with two goals, Elias Peterson. The number two star of the game with 37 saves on 39 shots, Jacob Markstrom. The number three star of the game with a goal, Brett Hutton. Tonight's slate is a big one. At 7 o'clock, you have four games. Flames, Sabres, Islanders, Penguins, Bruins, Hurricanes, and the Red Wings and the Blue Jackets. 7.30, you have the Stars and the Canadians and the Devils and the Lightning. 8 o'clock on NBCSN, two of the Western Conference contenders. You have the Golden Knights and the Predators. I expect this game to be called by John Forslund and Pierre Maguire. I could be wrong. Well, the case against John Forslund is because the Hurricanes play tonight. Maybe it's Kenny Albert, but the Rangers are on the West Coast. So, maybe it's not Albert. 
Or maybe it is Albert. Because he did not call the Rangers game against the Kings because he had football and the Rangers don't play. Oh, wait, they play tonight. I thought they played tomorrow. That's my mistake. So it's not going to be Kenny Albert. So it'll probably either be John Forsland, Gordon Miller, or maybe even Chris Cuthbert on the call on the NBC Sports Network. I'd be surprised if it was Kenny Albert or uh, Doc Emmerich. And I do expect Pierre Maguire to be between the benches, either him or uh, Brian Boucher. 9 o'clock, you have the Wild and the Oilers. Oh, and by the way, I didn't even give a pick for that game. I think Nashville takes it at home because they're off to a pretty good start. The Knights haven't been impressive on the road. So there's the logic for that. So, yeah, Wild Oilers at 9, 10 o'clock, Senators, Coyotes, and the Flyers and the Ducks. 10.30, you have the Rangers at the Sharks. A couple trades that I want to get to, but I want to discuss an incident with the Giants' third-string quarterback, Kyle Laletta. He was arrested this morning. That's just not a good look for the Giants. They've had a disastrous season. I've already said over and over on this podcast that I'm sick of talking about them because they really have been the talking point of sports for all the wrong reasons over the last month plus. We have just more bad happening to the New York football giants. Demarius Thomas was traded from the Denver Broncos to the Houston Texans today along with a seventh-round pick. Denver gets back a fourth. So I think this is a big move for the Texans that puts them as the favorites to win the AFC South. I picked them to win the AFC South before the season, but I kind of gave up on them after their 0-3 start and they lost at home to the Giants. They've turned a corner since then, took advantage of a bit of an easy schedule. And it looks like that they're going to be a playoff team and maybe Bill O'Brien ends up saving his job after all. But I really think a first-round exit doesn't survive Bill O'Brien. I think he has to go further than the first round to solidify himself back for next season. Because the Texans were one of the teams that underachieved a year ago and thought they were a contender again. And Bill O'Brien is certainly a guy that's under immense pressure this year. So big trade for Houston, and they do that in wake of Will Fuller tearing his ACL. So it kind of makes up for that loss a little bit. Golden Tate was traded from the Lions to the Eagles. The trade gets back a third. This is a good trade for Philly. They're Receivers have either been injured or underperforming this year. I think Golden Tate would help them a lot. Another trade that happened was HaHa ha Clinton Dix getting sent from the Green Bay Packers to the Washington Redskins. I think that's a big get for Washington, and that puts them right in the conversation with Philly as co-favorites in the NFC East. Washington is overachieved this year, and it's funny because Alex Smith really hasn't been good this year, and they're doing this with a resurgent Adrian Peterson and the defense that has exceeded some expectations. And that defense just got better with the deal for the former Packers defensive back. And speaking of the Packers, they traded away the scapegoat from last week, Ty Montgomery, to the Baltimore Ravens for a seventh-round pick. I like the pickup for Baltimore. It makes their offense better. Maybe the trade will motivate Montgomery. And it's like a learning lesson for him a little bit. And uh, it's weird seeing the Packers as a seller because they're still in the hunt for an NFC wildcard because I made the case several times on this podcast that that last playoff spot in the NFC is wide open because you have the NFC East to me, which is a two-team race between the Redskins and the Eagles. You could make a case the Cowboys belong, but they lost to Washington, and I just don't trust Jason Garrett. So, to me, they're a fraud. Maybe Amari Cooper does make their team better, but we'll see. And that's another coach under immense pressure, Jason Garrett, with a couple underachieving years and um, the offense not 
performing to expectations this year. But Jerry Jones is obviously at fault a little bit because he didn't address the receiver position in the offseason. And he did with the trade, but my issue is that Amari Cooper is not a number one receiver. He's more of like a number two or a number three guy rather than a number one. But he was highly dr drafted by the Raiders, and he just really didn't pan out. But I could be wrong there. So you have Philly and Washington in the NFC East. So one of those two teams will make it. You have the Saints and the Panthers for the South. I don't think the Saints are a lock to win the, the NFC South because I think the Panthers are as just as good. I can't wait till those two teams face off later in the season. Those head-to-head -head matchups will determine that division because I think Carolina is very underrated. I picked them to win that division before the season. I did correctly predict the breakout for Christian McCaffrey and for Cam Newton to be a Dark Horse MVP candidate this year. So that was a good call by me. And the Saints, meanwhile, are among the best five teams in the league. I'll get to the power rankings shortly. And then in the NFC North, you have, the, I think the Vikings are going to win that division. I just don't trust Mitch Trubisky for a full season. And then Kirk Cousins, despite being known for costly mistakes from when he was with the Redskins and then he threw the big, big six in the uh, Sunday nighter against the Saints the other night. And he threw some costly interceptions in that Packers game too. But I just think the Vikings have the most talent in that division, so I would pick them right now. And in the West, the Rams have that division locked and loaded. And then the wild card contenders are the loser of Saints-Panthers. And then that last spot, you have the Bears. Heck, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of two NFC East teams making the playoffs. I have to put the Eagles in that conversation. Or Washington. The loser of Eagles, Washington. The Bears. Maybe Seattle. I'm just not sold on Dallas. I mean, if Atlanta starts playing better, that was a big win for them over the Giants last week. The game that they absolutely had to have. I think the Bucks are, are, are screwed. They're just a mess. So I'm not putting them in the conversation. Atlanta, I think, belongs. But it's like a cautious. And then I wouldn't even rule out the Lions, despite the trade of Golden Tate. And the Green Bay Packers, despite the two trades they made today. So that's your NFC playoff picture. But back to the trades. Um, speaking of the Rams, they traded for Dante Fowler. And I think that's a good move to uh, bolster their pass rush. I'm surprised that Jacksonville traded Fowler. But at the same time, I shouldn't be because he has had some off-field issues in the past. And then some trades that didn't happen. The Giants didn't trade Janoris Jenkins like many people thought. Landon Collins is still a member of the Giants. Another player rumored to be traded, but wasn't traded, was San Francisco wide receiver Pierre Garçon. I think that San Francisco could have got something for him. Oakland's already made some moves. I already talked about last week the Giants moving on from Damon Harrison and Eli Apple. And then another player that wasn't traded today that was rumored was Deshaun Jackson of Tampa Bay. All right, let's move on from that. And keeping the NFL conversation, I just went over the NFC playoff picture. Before I do the power rankings, I want to talk about the AFC real quick. I think New England's a shoe win in that division. I think the AFC North is a three-team horse race between the Bengals, the Ravens, and the Steelers. Big game this weekend in Baltimore. The winner of that game, I think, is in the driver's seat because Pittsburgh already beat Cincinnati. Although Baltimore beat Pittsburgh, Baltimore also lost to Cincinnati. We can't forget that. That Week 2 game was a big win for Cincinnati, that primetime game in which Andy Dalton lit the world on fire in primetime for once. That was one of the more forgotten wins or forgotten big wins of the season. So that's a three-team race, so... 
there's that. And then the South, I think that's the Texans division to lose with the trading for Demarius Thomas. And Deshaun Watson is starting to look like the guy that he was from last year a little bit. And in the NFC West, I think, I'm sorry, the AFC West, listen, I don't think it's a lock that the Chiefs are winning that division. The Chargers have two losses. They are right there. If they pick off the Chiefs, granted the game's at Arrowhead, but if they pick the Chiefs off, and I don't even know what week that is, I think it's like week 13 or something like that, then they're right back in the conversation, and you never know. What if the Chiefs get caught looking ahead somewhere and the Chargers win out? So it's not inconceivable that the Chargers can steal that division from Kansas City. But I, if I had the bet right now, I'd bet the Chiefs. And then the two wild cards to me are wide open. You have the Chargers, who I just mentioned. I'm writing off the AFC South teams because I'm not sold that Jacksonville is going to make a run, especially after trading Dante Fowler and the struggles of Blake Bortles. Tennessee, I don't see it from them. They have a lot of injuries. Indy's had a ton of injuries as well. Although Andrew Luck's playing very well. In the North, you have the two teams I talked about before that are not in first place in that division right now. Or the two teams that don't end up in first as the season ends. And then I just don't see the Jets, the Dolphins, or the Bills making a run. Even though the Dolphins... I believe are four and four. I just don't see it for them. They looked like a fraud at home against the Lions, and then uh, I wasn't expecting them to beat Houston, but they did not look good in that game either. So I'm writing them off. So you have three teams for two spots as the wild cards in the AFC, and meanwhile that final spot in the NFC I think can be had between five to six teams. And we'll talk about the playoffs as the weeks go on and who to cross off and who not to cross off. I'm going to go through the power rankings right now. Number 32 is the Bills. 31 is the Raiders. 30 is the Giants. 29 is the Cardinals. 28 is the 49ers. 27 is the Colts. 26 is the Bucks. 25 is the Broncos. 24 is the Jets. 23 is the Browns. 22 is the Titans. Those teams I just listed are all cross-offs. Number 21 is the Atlanta Falcons. I don't have them as a cross-off because they have a favorable schedule going forward. They have the Bucks one more time. They have to play the Cowboys. They have to play some other weaker teams. Number 20 is a team I crossed off, and that's the Miami Dolphins. I just don't think they're as good as the other contenders in the AFC. Number 19 is the Lions. I do not have the Lions as a cross-off, even though they just lost... A tough one at home against Seattle in which a game they're never really in. But I can't rule them out because they've had some big wins this year, including at home against the Packers. And they have a big one on Sunday against the Vikings. If they can steal that game, then they can be right back in the conversation. 18's the Jaguars. They're a cross-off to me for reasons I just talked about. 17's the Cowboys. To me, they're a cross-off with an asterisk. And the reason why it's an asterisk because they are they're three and four, and they still have to play the Giants one more time. They have a couple other winnable games on their schedule. They have the Titans coming up. They can win that game and go to four and four. So I can't cross off the Cowboys yet, but to me they have an asterisk by them. Sixteen's the Green Bay Packers. I talked about them. They're not a cross off. Fifteen is the fifteen's the Houston Texans. I think they're the team that will come out of the AFC South. They've really looked better and better these last couple weeks. Number 14 is the Philadelphia Eagles. They made a trade to improve themselves. I think them and the Redskins will be battling out for the NFC East. 13 is the Seattle Seahawks. I can't cross them off either because they've beaten some decent teams this year and went toe-to-toe with the Rams. 12 is the Bears. I think they're in play for that last wild card spot. If I had to pick a team that's going to end up with it, I'd say the Chicago Bears are my pick. Although, the Redskins or the Eagles are also in play. The the second place NFC East team I'm talking about. 
11 is the Cincinnati Bengals. They had a big win against the Bucks, a game that they absolutely had to have. 10 is the Washington Redskins. That's a team that's currently in first in their division. They improved themselves today by getting Ha Ha Clinton Dix. And to me, them and the Eagles are the co front runners in that division, and those two had the head matchups will be vital. Number nine is the Baltimore Ravens. This is, to me, a good team despite being 4-4. Four and four. They had that close loss at home against the Saints in the game, which they should have won. And then they got blown out by Carolina. But they, let's face it, they were looking ahead to the Steelers. And I think that there's a chance they win on Sunday, but I... Not doing my picks yet. You'll wait and see till Friday to see who I'm really picking in that game. And speaking of the Steelers, they're number eight. They've ride the ship a little bit. To me, they're the favorites in that division. They had the big win over Cincinnati. If they get a big win on Sunday in Baltimore, then I think they're absolutely in the driver's seat. Seven is the Carolina Panthers. To me, this is the Super Bowl contender that nobody's talking about. They're not getting respect that they absolutely deserve. And I talked about it before. I think there's a chance that they can steal this division from New Orleans. Number six is the Los Angeles Chargers. I talked about them and the possibility of them winning the AFC West. But the one thing going against them is that they still don't have Joey Bosa. Number five is the Minnesota Vikings. That was a disappointing loss against the Saints. And I think they rebound from that. They'll probably be in the playoffs because of their pure talent. Everson Griffin came back. That'll help their defense going forward. Number four is the New England Patriots. They're still the Patriots. They didn't look great last night. They needed a pick six to put that game away. But this is still one of the best teams in the league. Number three is the Kansas City Chiefs. Yes, the Patriots beat the Chiefs. But the Chiefs have looked better than the Patriots since the Patriots beat the Chiefs. Number two is the New Orleans Saints. They had, in my opinion, one of the best wins you can have all season at Minnesota. Winning at Minnesota is very difficult. And they have a golden opportunity to get another signature win at home against the Rams on Sunday. And the Rams are number one. They traded for Dante Fowler. This team is all win. They are, in my opinion, the favorites to win the Super Bowl, and they should be. That was, this was my preseason pick, and I'm not backing off of it anytime soon. Guess the lines for Week 9. This is a pretty fun game that I do each and every week. I did it yesterday with college. I've been doing it every week for college, and now I do it every week for the NFL. I'm going to start with Thursday night. You have a terrible game on hand. The 49ers hosting the Raiders. These are two of the worst teams in the league. One of them was tanking before the season began, and the other one thought they were a contender before the year. But now they're not because they lost their quarterback. I picked San Francisco to be a three-point favorite at home in this game. And that's exactly what the line is. San Francisco is favored by three points at home against the Oakland Raiders. With the worst cor- worst or quarterback, by the way, too. C.J. Beathard's looked terrible since that Green Bay game. Boys, Green Bay... Really uh, making bad quarterbacks look good. You have the Chicago Bears at the Cleveland Browns. Or I'm sorry, the Buffalo Bills. I thought that said Browns. Oops. 1 o'clock on Fox. I have the Bills as, I'm sorry, the Bears as a four and a half point favorite. And the Bears are laying nine, which is a big number. 
a very big number, despite the uh, quarterback controversy in Buffalo, if that even is one at this point. You have the Chiefs at the Browns. I have Kansas City laying a touchdown, and they're laying eight and a half. Boy, does everybody love the Chiefs. This could be a trappy spot with the Browns with their new coach. The Jets at the Dolphins, I have Miami laying three. And that's what the line is. So another correct pick for guess the lines. Next is the Lions and the Vikings. I have Minnesota laying seven and a half. Yes, that's a big number, but that's my pick. And they're laying five. So I was a little bit off there. You have the Atlanta Falcons at the Washington Redskins. This is a vital game for Atlanta to keep their playoff hopes alive. They'll probably cross them off if they lose this game. Washington, I have laying three and a half in their home building. Fresh off the win at MedLife Stadium. And Washington's only favored by one and a half. Hmm. I guess that's a little bit too much respect for uh, Atlanta. And Washington didn't look all that great yesterday, but, or I'm sorry, Sunday, but the Giants are just so bad. They make everybody look good. The Bucks at the Panthers, I have Carolina laying seven. Carolina is laying six and a half. So I was a half point off there. In one of the best games of the week, you have the Steelers at the Ravens. I have the Steelers as a one-point favorite in Baltimore, and Baltimore is actually a three-point favorite. Hmm. That's probably the correct move, but... I just think that, or thought that Vegas would give the Steelers a slim minus. The Demarius Thomas Bowl, Texans at the Broncos. I have Denver minus one at home against the Houston Texans, and they're minus one and a half. They are still favored despite the trading of Demarius Thomas. Hmm. Maybe they see a little bit of a letdown for Houston, finally. Chargers at the Seahawks. I have the Seahawks as a one-point favorite, and Seattle's laying one and a half. The Rams and the Saints. The game of the year. So far, I have New Orleans as a three-point favorite, and they are a point-and-a-half favorite. Yes, the Saints absolutely deserve to be favored in this game. They are the home team. The Rams have some injuries in their secondary. And New Orleans has made some improvements at the deadline. And again, some guys healthy. Drew Brees has been phenomenal. That defense is getting better. They had a pick six against the Vikings the other night. So they are a deserving favorite. Yes, the Rams are on the unbeaten team. But if this game was in Los Angeles, then the Rams would be favored. But because of home field advantage and how improved the Saints have been since their disastrous loss in Week 1. They deserve to be favored in this spot. The Patriots host the Packers, and I have Tom Brady laying 6.5 to Aaron Rodgers, and Tom Brady's laying 5.5 to Aaron Rodgers. I guess some people bought into the Packers' performance in Los Angeles last week. And meanwhile, the Pats didn't look great. Last night. And last but not least, you have the Titans at the Cowboys on Monday Night Football. I have the Cowboys by four and a half, and the Cowboys are laying six and a half. That is pathetic. That is the stupidest line of the week. The Cowboys shouldn't be favored by more than six over any somewhat mediocre-ish team. And that, I mean, there should be some teams they should be that big of a favorite over, but... The Titans are not one of them. The Titans aren't that bad. The Cowboys aren't this good. They're probably better than the Titans, but not that much better. It should be probably somewhere between three and five or even four and a half where I picked. But six and a half is just too many points for the Cowboys to be giving against a team that isn't that terrible. Next, I'm going to do my baseball power rankings as we head closer to the offseason. I'm going to go through them and 
go off a bold prediction for every team this offseason. Number 30 is the Baltimore Orioles. They're going to have a new manager. They're going to maybe have a new GM too. We'll see about that. My bold prediction for them is that they try so hard to dump Chris Davis and his owner's contract, but they ultimately fail. Number 29 is the Kansas City Royals, another team that was terrible this year. My bold prediction for them is that second baseman Whit Merrifield will be traded. Number 28 is the Miami Marlins, who somehow avoided 100 losses. My bold prediction for them is that they will trade all-star catcher JT Realmuto. 27 is the Chicago White Sox, who, in my opinion, were one of the more disappointing teams in the league this year. I thought that they'd be a surprise, but I was wrong. But my prediction for them is that Jose Abreu will have trade rumors swirling around, but ultimately he stays put. Number 26 is the Detroit Tigers, who also were bad this year. My bold prediction for them is that Michael Fulmer will finally be traded. Number 25 is the Cincinnati Reds, who have a new manager. And it's going to be interesting to see what way they go this offseason. So my prediction is that they'll trade away closer Rossiel Iglesias. Number 24 is the Texas Rangers. They're going to have a new manager after the firing of Jeff Bannister. My bold prediction for them is that they'll blow their team up in flames and start from scratch. There's not one player on this roster that if you told me or if I saw Buster Olney or Ken Rosenthal tweet that they've been traded, then I wouldn't be shocked. Number 23 is the San Diego Padres. They're interesting. They have really move themselves in the right direction with all the collection of prospects they have. My bold prediction for them is that they'll package some of them and trade for an ace starting pitcher. I don't know if that's Michael Fulmer, who I don't think is an ace. Maybe it's New York's Noah Syndergaard or Jacob deGrom. Maybe it's somebody I'm not even thinking of. Number 22 is the San Francisco Giants. They had another disastrous season. And my bold prediction for them is something I predicted before the start of last season. And the Giants were overachieving for most of the year. And that's why this particular prediction didn't happen. I think that they will trade Madison Bumgarner. Yeah, he gets his option picked up, but that doesn't mean that he's going to be with the Giants next year. They could potentially trade him and start from scratch. That's what they should do. They should be learning from the other Giants right now and some other sports franchises that made the mistake of keeping star players too long. But my case for Bumgarner is that trade him while he's in his prime before his value goes away. This reminds me a whole lot of Philadelphia when they traded Cole Hamels to Texas and they did that at the right time because he was their best asset but they waited too late to trade everybody else and they ended up getting a solid package for Hamels although they could have done better potentially if they traded him in 14 or 13 rather than 2015. The Toronto Blue Jays are number 21 and my bold prediction for them is that there will be trade rumors surrounding Marcus Stroman, but ultimately he starts the 2019 season with the Toronto Blue Jays. Number 20 is the Los Angeles Angels. My bold prediction for them is that they'll part ways with Albert Pujols. This is sad. Pujols is one of the greatest hitters of my lifetime, and he's certainly going to go down as a legend in... St. Louis, and even in Anaheim, even though he didn't win in Anaheim. But part of me does hope that this prediction's wrong because the Angels are scheduled to play in St. Louis next year. Then that would be, in theory, Albert Pujols' first games in St. Louis since he signed with the Angels. Number 19 is the Minnesota Twins. My bold prediction for them is that one of their young players will be traded. I don't know if that's Byron Buxton, whether that's 
Miguel Sano or even Jose Barrios, but I have a feeling that they give up on one of those underachieving players. Not to suggest that Barrios is underachieved, but I'm talking about more Sano and Buxton rather than Barrios, but I think they trade one of those two players away. Number 18 is the New York Mets. They just hired a new general manager and Brody Van Hagen. I made the mistake yesterday by saying Drew Van Der Hagen, but I was wrong with the first name. That's my fault. And my bold prediction for them is that they'll stand pat this offseason for the most part and keep Jacob DeGrom and Noah Syndergaard on their team. And the media will go nuts in terms of why didn't you trade these guys. You need to start from scratch. And the Mets fans will be happy because then they'll talk themselves into their team being decent. Number 17 is the Pittsburgh Pirates. My bold prediction for them is very simple. They're the mystery team. I have no idea what they're going to do. They scream mystery team to me. Number 16 is the Seattle Mariners. My bold prediction for them is that they'll make the first trade of the month of November. That always seems to be the case each and every year. Number 15 is the Arizona Diamondbacks. My bold prediction for them is that they will trade Zach Greinke and Paul Goldschmidt and start a rebuild. Number 14 is the Philadelphia Phillies. My bold prediction for them is that they will sign Manny Machado. They'll fit him in somewhere. Maybe they put him at third base and get rid of Mikel Franco. Maybe they put him at shortstop and trade away J.P. Crawford for a pitcher to go with Aaron Nola in that rotation. So that is going to be very interesting to see how that plays out because I really think that the Phillies are going to be a serious suitor for both Machado and Bryce Harper, but they're the team that gets Machado. The Washington Nationals. They'll make a bold move via trader free agency despite losing Bryce Harper. I don't know what that is necessarily. Maybe they trade for one of the Rangers players like a Joey Gallo or an Elvis Andrews or, or not Andrews because they have a shortstop, but you know what I mean. Like somebody like that or another player that underperformed or something and they take a chance on them but they'll do something bold maybe they trade for J2 Real Mudo but they'll do that in spite of losing Bryce Harper number 12 is the Oakland Athletics I think they will acquire whether that's trade or free agency an above average starting pitcher to go with Kenta Maeda atop of that rotation Wait a minute, Maeda, I think, is recovering from Tommy John, so you might not even see him. But if, anyway, they'll get an ace somehow. Number 11 is the Tampa Bay Rays. What a great season they had. Kevin Cash, to me, should absolutely be considered for the American League Manager of the Year Award. Two of his staff members have become managers, which is pretty impressive. But my bold prediction for the Tampa Bay Rays is that they will sign an impact bat in free agency or trade for one. Their offense, to me, is what needs to improve on this team. Their, their pitching staff is phenomenal, especially their rotation and with their openers who have all shown improvements throughout the year. But I really think that they want to go up rather than down. And they'll sign an impact bat or trade for an impact bat in that lineup. I heard a rumor that Josh Donaldson could be in play for them. That could be it, but they have Matt Duffy at third base. Maybe they move on from him. But somebody like that. I just don't think that Josh Donaldson's on the level he was three years ago. But he's still an impact player, per se. Number 10 is the St. Louis Cardinals. They had a great run at the end of the year, fell short. Mike Schilt got the permanent managerial job. 
My bold prediction for them is that they'll sign one of the top relievers on the free agent market, whether that's Andrew Miller, David Robertson, Adam Ottavino seems like a logical fit there. Maybe Cody Allen. But their bullpen needs help, and that is one of the big reasons why they didn't hold on to that wild card spot at the end of the year. Number nine is the Colorado Rockies. There will be trade rumors surrounding Nolan Arenado because he enters 2019 in a contract year, but he stands put. I don't think there's a chance that Nolan Arenado gets traded, but I think there's going to be talk on the MLB Network's winter meetings show about the possibility of him being traded. So there you go. That counts. If that happens, then that both well, predictions a win. Number eight is the Atlanta Braves. What a great year. They won the National League East. Could have potentially forced the Game 5 against the Dodgers. They had the lead in Game 4, blew it. And then the Dodgers went on and advanced. But my bold prediction for Atlanta is that they'll acquire a starting pitcher to go in that rotation along with Mike Fault, the units, and Julio Tehran. Although Tehran wasn't even in their postseason rotation. Sean New comes in that rotation. But yeah, I think they'll gather up some prospects and make a move. And number seven is the Milwaukee Brewers, who took the Dodgers to Game 7 of the NLCS. They had a phenomenal season. I think this team isn't far away at all. This was no fluke. This team nearly made the playoffs in 2017, but Colorado held them off. But... They end up winning the NL Central this year in an upset fashion over the Cubs. And I don't think this team's going away. My bold prediction for them is that they improve that rotation and go out and get an arm. A lot of people are linking them to Sonny Gray of the Yankees, who really didn't pan out in New York. I expect the Yankees to trade him, especially to the National League, though. I think a team like Atlanta or Milwaukee would make all the sense in the world for Sonny Gray and would be great on either one of those two teams. Number six is the Cleveland Indians. I think this is the most disappointing contender in baseball this year, not necessarily the most disappointing team. But out of the contenders, I think this was the most disappointing unless you consider the Nationals a contender. But I'm talking about of the, of the playoff teams that this was the biggest disappointment. I really thought this team had a chance to win the World Series. They were swept by Houston and that didn't look that much better because Houston ended up losing in five to Boston. But my bold prediction for the Indians is that they bring back one of their free agent relievers. Either Andrew Miller or Cody Allen will re-sign with the Cleveland Indians. And that would be big for them. Number five is the Chicago Cubs. Another disappointing contender this year, losing in that NL wild card game in heartbreak fashion at home against the Rockies after losing the 163 tie-breaking game at home against the Milwaukee Brewers. My bold prediction for them is that they bring back Cole Hamels and pick up his option. And they'll have a nice front front of that rotation with him and John Lester, and then they get you Darvish next year back. And let's hope he uh, rebounds after what was a disastrous year for him last year. Number four is the New York Yankees. There's some people out there that have them number two and number three in their way too early predictions or power rankings for next year and as we go into the off season, but I have them at number four. They had a disappointing series against the Red Sox in a series and I think they probably should have won. They should have won game one and they should have won game four. And maybe they're holding up the commissioner's trophy, not the Red Sox, if that's not the case. Or maybe they lose to Houston, but, or maybe they lose to the Dodgers, but you never know. But, yeah, they were sort of a disappointment last year, or this past year, I should say, even though they won 100. But I do expect this team to be better next year, and that's because my bold prediction, not only do I think they'll sign Patrick Corbin to improve their rotation to put him at the top with Luis Severino and Masahiro Tanaka, 
and I think they'll bring back Jay Happ as well. I think they'll bring back David Robertson. I think they're going to sign Bryce Harper. This was rumored for three years now. Three years. And I think it happens. He'll be their starting left fielder next year. Aaron Judge will be in right. Aaron Hicks will be in center. Giancarlo Stanton will be your DH. I was going to predict them to sign Manny Machado too, but I think the antics of him in the playoffs have them backed off and then they'll go after Harper instead and Corbin instead and maybe maybe they do end up with all three of them. You never know. But I do think they'll ultimately end up with Bryce Harper. They'll pass on Manny Machado and keep Miguel Andujar at third base. And then maybe they go out and get a cheap first baseman or stick with Luke Voigt. And the case for them getting Machado is that Didi Gregorius is out half of the year with Tommy John surgery, and they have an opening there. But maybe they'll bring back Neil Walker and put Gleyber Torres at shortstop. So the Yankees, to me, are by far the most fascinating team of the offseason. I think they dictate what everybody does, and they have the keys to the offseason. I think... Everything goes through the Bronx in the offseason, and they're the team to watch for many different reasons. And don't rule them out in any Madison Bumgarner trade possibilities either. It's going to be them, the Dodgers, even though I don't see San Francisco trading with their rival. I think Milwaukee and Atlanta are going to be in play for Bumgarner. I think the Houston Astros could be in play for Bumgarner. Because my bold prediction for them, I'm going to get to them in a couple minutes, but it'll make sense why in a couple minutes when I say that prediction, maybe a dark horse like an Indians, maybe. I don't see the Red Sox going after him because they don't have the farm system to do it, and plus they just won the World Series. So I, I think that they'll kind of just back off trades in the off season. But, yeah, keep an eye out in the, for the Yankees because they're the team to watch. And the Dodgers are number three. They just lost in five games to the Red Sox. And I think that they'll be in the market for Bryce Harper and Manny Machado. I already listed my predictions for what I think happens with them. But my bold prediction for them is that they will – extend Clayton Kershaw and make him a Dodger for life. Number two is the Houston Astros. They lost in five to the Red Sox. And I thought that was a huge disappointment because of how good they looked against Cleveland. And everybody said they were the favorite, including myself. But that was such a disappointment losing to the Red Sox. But this is still a good team. But my bold prediction for them in the offseason is that they'll lose either Dallas Keuchel or Charlie Morton in free agency. And that's why I wouldn't rule out them as a possibility to trade for Madison Bumgarner. Imagine having him in Verlander atop that rotation. Oh, boy. And you know they're not going to sit with their hands crossed because they know the Yankees are going to improve. And they were disappointed by losing in the ALCS because they really thought that they were going to repeat. And number one is the Red Sox. They deserve to be there. They just won the World Series. 108 wins in the regular season. 119 wins overall. My bold prediction for them is that they re sign Craig Kimbrell and Nathan Evaldi. They have to bring back Kimbrell, even though he had a disappointing playoffs. And Evaldi is one of the big reasons why they're hoisting the Commissioner's Trophy. So I think they'll bring him back. I don't know if they'll bring back Steve Pierce or not. I have a feeling somebody's going to overpay for him. And plus, they already have Mitch Moreland at first base, who I think is a solid player. So I think they will re-sign Nathan Avaldi and Craig Kimbrell. And that's for it for the baseball predictions for the offseason. And now, very quickly, I'm going to predict how the college football playoff is going to play out. I'm going to go from 25 to 7, just like the ESPN show does. 
and then I'm going to go from 1 to 6, and then I'll just rip through the rest of the power rankings. Number 25 is Texas A&M. They've been a surprise team, in my opinion, this year. Jimbo Fisher's done a great job. They have that close loss at home against Clemson, which I think is a big reason why they'll be in these rankings. They also have some good wins this year. Number 24 is Mississippi State. They knocked off Texas A&M, and that's why they're ahead of Texas A&M in these rankings. Joe Moore has done a nice job in year, year one, despite a terrible season from Nick Fitzgerald in that offense, really. Number 23 is the Oklahoma State Cowboys. I think the committee's going to overreact to their big win over Texas and put them right in the top 25 even though they've had some bad losses this year. Number 22 is Virginia. They had the big win against Miami. They had a nice win against Duke, and they belong on this list. Number 21 is the NC State Wolfpack. Yeah, they just had back-to-back -back losses, but they started the year undefeated, and I just think that the committee is just going to put some random Clemson opponents on there as well as opponents Alabama have seen. Well, Texas A&M. And um, that's that. And Texas A&M, by the way, both played, uh, or played both Alabama and Clemson. And NC State played Clemson. Boy, if NC State played West Virginia, then that would have been a much interesting conversation. The winner of that game, that never happened. That's too bad for both of those schools. Number 20 is the Syracuse Orange. They have the big win over NC State. They nearly knocked off Clemson. Number 19 is Boston College. They just had the nice win over Miami on Friday night. And they beat some other good teams this year too. Number 18 is Houston. They're the second best team in the American Conference this year. They just knocked off USF. I just think that the committee is going to give them some respect. Number 17 is the Iowa Hawkeyes. Yes, they just lost to Penn State, but this team is pretty solid. Their other loss came against Wisconsin at home, but that was earlier in the year. They have some pretty big wins this year as well. Number 16 is Utah. They had the impressive win at UCLA. Yeah, they lost at home to Washington, but they've played better since then. They had the win at Stanford. They had the big win over USC. Number 15 is the Texas Longhorns. They had a nice little run between week one and now. But I just think the committee's still going to put them in there because they have the big win over Oklahoma. Number 14 is the West Virginia Mountaineers. My issue with them is that they really haven't been anybody decent this year. They have an opportunity on Saturday against Texas to put themselves in the conversation for the college football playoff. Because I think one loss Big 12 champion is a possibility assuming one of the other conferences has a two loss or even a three loss champ. And if Notre Dame loses somewhere around the, along the line. And you can't sleep on West Virginia. I think that if they win this Texas game, then they really have to be taken seriously. They had that bad loss at Iowa State, which I think is why people are down on them. They had the impressive win over Baylor the other night. And I keep mentioning the NC State game, but, geez, if they beat NC State, then they, I think they would have gotten a little bit more respect, although NC State was blown out by Clemson and lost to Syracuse too. So maybe they're really not that good. 13 is the Penn State Nittany Lions. Yes, they have two losses, and I have them ahead of the Mountaineers. But I just think that they're going to give a little bit more love to the Big Ten than the Big 12. They just beat Iowa. They had the bad home loss against Michigan State. The close home loss against Ohio State. They probably should have won that game because they had the double-digit lead in the fourth quarter. Number 12 is the Florida Gators. They've had a good year. Two losses all year, one against Georgia last weekend, and the other was at home against Kentucky. Kentucky, I'll get to in a minute. Number 11 is UCF. I think that 
the Knights are the most interesting team to look for tonight in these rankings. Because they're undefeated and they're a group of five team. But I just have them at 11. Number 10 is the Kentucky Wildcats. They really need to be taken seriously right now. They only have one loss all season. They had the big win over Missouri. And now they have a big one at home against Georgia to keep their playoff hopes alive. Number 9 is Washington State. The Cougars are a sleeper in this. And they really have to be taken seriously if they start winning games. And they have the big win at Stanford. They have the big win at home against Oregon. They have Washington coming up. So the Pac-12 isn't dead yet. Number 8 is Ohio State. I think this is the favorite still to come out of the Big Ten. I'll get to Michigan in a minute. But they do have that loss at Purdue. Listen, they played bad in that game. But I still think Ohio State's a good team. I think the Tyler Trent story, I think, brought the best out of Purdue that night. And I just keep saying on the podcast, and um, I'm still going to buy that notion. Number seven is the Oklahoma Sooners. This is my highest ranked Big 12 team. I'm interested to see where all these Big 12 contenders, them, Texas, and West Virginia are all placed. Well, it's really just them in West Virginia now. Texas has two losses. But I'm interested to see where the Sooners are placed. Their lone loss was against Texas in the Cotton Bowl on a field goal. If that doesn't happen, then they're undefeated and they're probably in the top four, perhaps. And now I'm going to go from one to six. Number one, I think, will be the Clemson Tigers. They have the close win at A&M. They have the dominant win over NC State. The dominant win over Florida State, even though Florida State isn't the Florida State of old. This team has been so good. Trevor Lawrence has been phenomenal since starting over, or taking over as the starting quarterback. They won at Georgia Tech. They have Boston College coming up later in the year. They survived against Syracuse, but if Lawrence doesn't get hurt in that game, maybe that's a blowout. Number two, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. They have the big week one home win over Michigan. They've had some other big wins this year in which people doubted them. They won at Wake Forest. They won at Virginia Tech. They have a big one coming up at Northwestern. They beat Stanford. So this is a very good team. And I think one of the favorites to go to the playoffs, assuming they don't lose. Number three is the Alabama Crimson Tide. I believe this is the best team in the country. But I just don't think that they're going to be in the top two because their resume isn't as strong as Clemson's or Notre Dame's. Their best win is arguably their home win over Texas A&M, who I have at number 25 on this list. They have a golden opportunity on Saturday night for a signature win at LSU, and that's who I have at number four. They have a phenomenal resume. They have the win over Georgia. They have the win over Miami. They have the win at Auburn. Their lone loss came at Florida. That's not a bad loss because I have Florida number 12 in these rankings, and that's a big reason why I have Florida pretty high. And I have them ahead of West Virginia, who is a one-loss team from the Big 12. So, yeah, LSU is a deserving top-four spot. And number five, I have the Michigan Wolverines. Their lone loss came Opening week at Notre Dame. They haven't looked back since then. They've been on a roll since then. They've had some big wins. They won at Northwestern. They survived against Sparty. They have a big one at home this week against Penn State. They killed Wisconsin. So they belong in the top six. And then number six, I have the Georgia Bulldogs. They have the big win over Florida. Their lone loss came at LSU. Not a bad loss. I have LSU at number four on the on the rankings. And they've had some other nice wins too. 
But if Georgia wins out, then they should be in the playoff. So don't write them off just yet. Real, real quickly, I'm going to go from 26 to 130. Just not going to talk about these teams. Number 26, Michigan State. Number 27, Oregon. 28, Miami. 29, Cal. 30, Washington. 31, Utah State. 32, Fresno State. 33, Stanford. 34, San Diego State. 35, Northwestern. 36, Wisconsin. 37, Auburn. 38, Duke. 39, Iowa State. 40, Boise State. 41, Ole Miss. 42, South Carolina. 43, Texas Tech. 44, Georgia Tech. 45, Colorado. 46, Virginia Tech. 47, Temple. 48, Cincinnati. 49, Purdue. 50, Arizona State. 51, USC. 52, Army. 53, Buffalo. 54, Maryland. 55, South Florida, 56 UAB, 57 North Texas, 58 Baylor, 59 Northern Illinois, 60 Georgia Southern, 61 Appalachian State, 62 Troy, 63 BYU, 64 Arizona, 65 Missouri, 66 Florida State, 67 Indiana, 68 Wake Forest, 69 Vanderbilt, 70 Memphis, 71 Louisiana Tech, 72 Western Michigan, 73 Nevada, 74 Hawaii, 75 Toledo, 76 Minnesota, 77, Ohio, 78, Pitt, 79, Tennessee, 80, TCU, 81, Kansas State, 82, Nebraska, 83, UCLA, 84, Louisville, 85, Coastal Carolina, 86, Liberty, 87, SMU, 88, FIU, 89, Middle Tennessee, 90, Marshall, 91, Arkansas State, 92, Eastern Michigan, 93, FAU, 94, Air Force, 95, New Mexico, 96, Wyoming, 97, Colorado State, 98, Illinois, 99, Navy, 100, Tulane, 101, Arkansas, 102, Louisiana, Monroe, 103, Louisiana, 104, Tulsa, 105, Akron, 106, Charlotte, 107, Ball State, 108, Southern Miss, 109, Miami of Ohio, 110, UTSA, 111, East Carolina, 112, Oregon State, 113, Kansas, 114, UMass, 115, North Carolina, 116, Old Dominion, 117, Rutgers, 118, UNLV, 119, South Alabama, 120, Georgia State, 121, Texas State, 122, New Mexico State, 123, San Jose State, 124, Western Kentucky, 125, Yukon, 126, Central Michigan, 127, Bowling Green, 128, Kent State, 129, Rice, and 130 is UTEP. I'm going to do some quick picks for tonight for college football. There's two games on tonight's slate. Both of them are, I believe, Maction. First time we have Maction on a Tuesday this year. Oh, wait, we had some games on a Tuesday nights, but they weren't Maction. They were Sun Belts. Both of these are Maction's. You have Kent State at Bowling Green, 8 o'clock on ESPNU. Two bad teams from the MAC going head to head. My pick for this game is Bowling Green. They're laying two, and I think they'll cover that with these. Second game, you have Miami of Ohio at Buffalo. 8 o'clock on ESPNU. Buffalo is the best team in the MAC this year. I think they win this game easily. They're a seven point favorite. So I think they cover that. So I'm taking both home teams to win, and the gambling plays for each of them, I am taking the favorites to cover in Buffalo and Bowling Green. That's it for today. That was a big podcast today. Tomorrow I'll be back recapping all the stuff from college football and NBA, NHL. I'm going to do second half bold predictions for the NFL on the Halloween edition of the podcast. I hope you guys have a great day, everybody.